Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Can everyone hear me, or approximately? Okay, great. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone to turn off their cell phones, please. Um, greetings, and welcome to the Menil Collection. My name is David Breslin, and I'm the John R. Eckel Jr. Foundation Chief Curator of the Menil Drawing Institute. I have the great pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Charles Ray. This is the first of three lectures that Charles will be presenting at the Menil over the next few months, gathered under the title, Thoughts on Sculpture. We're thrilled that all of you are here to think with Charles tonight, and hopefully also for the talks in January and March. And Charles, we're thoroughly grateful and thrilled that you thought of the Menil as the site to think out loud. It connects with the important mission of the Menil to not only be a place for arts display, but one that makes present, palpable, and alive the centrality of art to the human experience. Your artwork, as everyone here knows, does this beautifully, Charlie, but your writing about art is equally powerful and perhaps is something less known. It goes without saying that Charles is one of the most important artists working today. His work has been presented at the Whitney Biennial on five different occasions and twice at the Venice Biennale. His recent and staggering exhibition, Charles Ray Sculpture, 1997 to 2014, just closed earlier this month at the Art Institute of Chicago after its first presentation at the Kunstmuseum Basel in 2014. During a career of careful making, where time and duration is as crucial to the process as formal experimentation and meticulous execution, Charles also has been writing. Within the last three years, he has written essays and reviews on the work of, among others, John Chamberlain, Chris Burden, Anthony Caro, and David Smith. While each is different in its way of handling a particular artist's making, all of the writing shares an equal intensity and investment in looking, describing, and wrestling with a resolute object that stands before him. Not given to metaphor, the beauty of the writing comes from that profound and direct engagement a kind of empathy where the thing apprehended is always looked at, met, and respected, and not seen through. In his 2013 Remembrance of Anthony Caro, Charles wrote, a great work is not timeless. It seems the opposite as it rides through time in complex and marvelous ways. The next year, in an, in an essay on David Smith, he wrote, with time, Sculpture sheds its ideas, and what is left is what the artist made. How do certain works enter time while others die when we forget the purposes they originally served? We are so happy that you're here, Charlie, to give time to the work she'll discuss tonight in a lecture entitled Sculpture with Holes. Please join me in welcoming Charles Ray. Thank you for the introduction, for having me. Can everybody hear me? I guess I have to, I have to be careful to project. Um, my talk tonight won't be very scholarly. It will be um, coming from my life as a sculptor and my thinking about, um, not so much thinking about sculpture, but thinking about the world sculpturally, in a way. So. Uh, it, it, it as a field, a, a, as a thing, I, I, I've been involved in sculpture all my life, and I, it, it is the way um, I think about the world. So um, forgive me if I take some big leaps in what I talk about, because um, I see it as a um, uh, discussion and a... Uh, you know, it's great to be an artist and talk because you don't have to prove your point like a scholar does. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to acknowledge the masks before we start because the masks are sculptures full of holes. They have holes. And I want to tell you a, a story about a friend of mine, a Japanese carver, who was really honored by a, um, uh, a, a no actor who came to him and wanted a no mask carved 
in, in the past, actors have carved their own masks in no theater, but um, he asked Yubaku to, to carve him a mask, and Yubaku did, and um, the day came when it came to present it, and the actor took it and was thrilled and loved it and, and, and left. But then a few days later, came back a little bit nervous, and uh, there was a problem. And he said, you, you, you didn't put holes in the nostrils. And you said, why? And he said, because that's how a no actor sees. We don't look through the eyes of the mask. We look through the nostrils. So you see where your feet are. And I, I thought it was a, a, a beautiful story about us, about our nostrils and relationship to our eyes and, and how we move around the world and, um, and about holes. But with that, I, I, maybe I'll start. We all, oh, this series of lectures, the first one is titled uh, Sculpture with Holes. And it's really about, um, well, all three lectures are really about sculpture, and maybe really in the end about my sculpture. But um, the, the, the first, and the, the lectures are really one long lecture broken up into three parts. So it's, it, it, we begin with uh, sculpture with holes, which is really space, sculptural space, which is the sculptor's primary uh, medium. We, we sculptors, don't make art to sit in space. We use space to make our art. And the second lecture is titled Matisse and Super Clay. And it's about how Matisse's use of clay, and when he makes a bronze sculpture, the bronze is more clay-like than the clay. In, the, in that he used to model the sculpture. And it's really a lecture about sculptural material. And then the third lecture will be um, titled um, The Subject Matter as a Formal Element. So maybe it's really about sculptural armature and you know, what subject is in art, how important is it, what, 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 what really is it. So with that, I'll start and um, we all know what a hole is. Uh, mayors lose elections because of potholes. Um, we pick up the paper in the morning and the reporter will say, there's a $175 million hole made last night out at Edwards Air Force Base when the jet crashes into the ground. Um, this is our crater, our hole of everyday experience. This is Stephen Hawking, who had a lot to do with uh, theorizing black holes. And when Errol Flynn made a film about Hawking, he said that, uh, which I think is a really beautiful thing, he said that uh, Hawking himself is a black hole. And this is the uh, condition he has and information and ideas. So what, what, what Errol Flynn was trying to say is the reality of black holes comes out of Hawking's condition, which I, I think is kind of a fascinating thought in a way. I want to think a little bit about black holes where this thought that everything goes into them, light bends into it, it actually warps and bends the fabric of reality, you know, a fabric of space and time is bent around the gravity of a black hole, right? Pointing to the, con to the notion that space itself is not a uh, container, but is actually a pourable, movable, bendable, stretchable fabric. Photons, electrons, everything falls into the black hole 
And with that, I wanted to bring up this idea that um, John Wheeler, who is a, a great physicist, mathematician, and Wheeler actually coined the name in 1971, black holes. Right? Einstein predicted their existence. Uh, many people, they're really, in a sense, mathematical objects. Nobody can go in one, nobody can go near one. We can theorize about them, and we can see light bend around what we think are black holes. Um, Wheeler coined the term black hole, and uh, another interesting thing Wheeler did is a little known fact, unless you're a mathematician or a physicist, but every electron in the universe weighs a ridiculously small, yet re even more ridiculously specific number of weight. And its number of an electron mass is 9.1093835 times 10 to the minus 31. Very small number, very exact. Every single electron in the universe weighs this number. And in 1940, you all know Richard Feynman, the, Feynman, the famous physicist from Caltech, was a grad student of John Wheeler's. And Wheeler called him up at four in the morning, in the middle of the night, and he said, Richard, I know why every electron weighs exactly the same. And Feynman and his said, well, why, professor? He said, because there's only one electron. And it's moving forward and backward, making a huge knot. And we, when we make a cross section of that knot, we have the uni universe. And the backward moving electron is the positron. And it's quite fascinating. And the first thing Feynman said is, well, there's many more electrons than positrons, Professor. And Feynman said, oh, they're hiding in the protons. But it's a beautiful idea, and it did predict um, later, which uh, Feynman won a prize for and acknowledged um, that, that uh, positrons run backwards in time. So that's where the evening that, ca that came from. But now on, and this is a sculpture of Rodin's, it's a bust, a head, of, uh, from the sculptor Balzac. I think it's just a fabulous, fabulous sculpture, the sculpture itself, but this piece it was very instructive to me. It's in Paris at the Rodin Museum. And I spent a long time looking at it, and I want to bring attention to the eyes which we began with, with the masks. It's difficult to see in the slides. But to me, the eyes of Balzac, in these particular eyes, they're not giving way to a howlness inside, like an ancient bronze that's missing the court's eyes. That's carved space within the eyes. And in my mind, in my experience, rather, of the work, and of this work in particular, which I was shocked when I saw because of the material shift. I've only seen Balzac as a uh, pattern in plaster or as a bronze. But to, I thought it was ceramic at first, but it turns out it's stone. It's carved space in the eyes. So the eyes one of the first thoughts I had when I looked at this head of Balzac was the eyes were like black holes, like Hawking's eyes, that the world fell into those eyes. But unlike a black hole where information is lost forever or speculated coming out of a supernova somewhere else, it's just a mathematical idea, where, what happens to the world, you can kind of go into those eyes and you sense the materiality. They don't go in, they go in maybe as far as half my, uh, to, uh, to my first knuckle. But it's space enough and it's dark enough and it's carved space rather than hollow space. And what I think happens 
is that information, that world that goes into Balzac's eyes through Rodin's sculpting comes back out in the surface of the sculpture. Not the exact same information or the same equation, but a life force, a life energy, a being, a uh, presentness, a, 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 a Balzac in the world. And what makes, in a certain sense, the sculpture of Balzac, the head, present in our world, it's not Balzac in 1830, writing his first novel or in uh, having the problems he had um, when, uh, you know, being sent off to uh, boarding school or with the wet nurse and his, the coldness of his mother. It's not that world. It's this present world here because it is actually me, the viewer, going into the eyes with my whole mind and psychology and then coming back out in the topology of Balzac's surface of his personality, of his force as a persona. I think it's just extraordinary. And look at the gut. I mean, what's Balzac looking at? And then it's coming out of his belly. The critics, when Balzac made this piece, said it's a monstrosity. There could be no human figure under that drapery. And he called the critics into his studio and a group of people, and he took a sledgehammer and he banged the plaster drapery open and ripped it off. And there, if you've ever seen some of the other studies, is a perfectly anatomically correct Balzac. Of course, with a gut, but he's there as a formed person. So these holes of the eyes, right, I'm trying to get at the world, the present world, not the past world, the present world goes into those eyes and comes out as a force of the gut, of the stance, of the very surface of Balzac, of the foot, the foot's relationship to the base, to the form, and its total relationship of the sculpture to the gravitational field, not in an abstract way, but in a present social way. And, you know, it's, I think, rightly said that this can be considered the first truly modern sculpture. Its relationship to the field, to the gravitational field, it's, as you could think about it in terms of its weight and its gesture on that face and its rearing back is um, not such a classical pose, much more related to an artist like Richard Serra today. And I wanted to move to the next to another works that are coming after, Picasso's guitars. Which some people think when he made these, he didn't have any idea whatsoever of what he was doing. And I kind of agree. And I, I think that's a beautiful uh, way to think of them and to work. Um, they are so incredibly, I mean, obviously the whole is, is present of the, into the guitar. The, 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 the pieces are so crude and so warmly primitive and at the same time, simultaneously, so coldly, coolly analytic. When you think of space, if we don't think of space as a container, but think of it in a richer way as a dimension, and the third dimension has, you know, you can point up, you can point down, you can go left and right. If you go, if you want to understand what that means, what it means that you can only tie your shoes in the third dimension. You can't tie a pair of shoes in the fourth dimension, nor can you tie a pair of shoes in the second dimension, because the knot will cross and it, you know, it's impossible to make a knot in the second dimension. But if you go down a dimension, you can always understand 
a higher dimension. So when you look at a square from the third dimension into the second dimension, you see it's inside and it's outside simultaneously. Right? If you were a figure, impossible, but if you were in a thought experiment, if there were two-dimensional figures, a square would appear as a line. You couldn't ever access the inside of the square unless you could force your way in somehow. But from the third dimension, you can see the inside and the outside simultaneously of a square. A creature, if there could be such a thing, living in the fourth dimension, looking down at you, would see your inside as well as your outside simultaneously. So he could look at you and understand what you ate for lunch by you know, the condition of your heart. Picasso does a very beautiful thing where is the inside? Where is that hole going? We see both the inside and the outside of the Qatar simultaneously in a very kind of beautifully analytical way. You come to understand the nature of the guitar spatially from a position in the fourth dimension. To the point comes Obviously, the importance, too, of these works of all of a sudden, rather than <clears throat> reducing or building up with clay, we're knocking things together with hammers and nails and actually constructing. And then, of course, its relationship to primitive work. But here, you so understand the whole that the whole is now a positive. The whole isn't a passage and you're seeing external space and internal space of the guitar at the exact same moment without questioning what you're looking at. So spatially, these are, I think, it just extremely uh, sophisticated and new objects. This was a work of mine called Spinning Spot. And it's a portal, it's a, it's a circle that's at about my head height. And it's about the size of my head. And it's mounted in the wall. And it spins so fast, it appears stationary. And I actually put it in here because I was having a hard time with the, the slide that comes next, the, the transition from the guitars to the next work. So this had a circle, like that positive circle in Picasso's guitar that he put the, that, that. You know, so this, this made it easier for me. But it's a good point, and I was relating to, it's a good point to bring up, I was relating to the whole now in that last Picasso guitar, not even as a negative, but the whole itself as a positive. And if you start thinking about it, what is a whole? It is a positive. And um, it's an event. The mathematical definition of a whole is an object that you cannot shrink to a point, topologically. All right, so that's a very beautiful and profound thought because you cannot shrink a hole to a point it becomes an armature. It, 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 it becomes like a seed of a sculpture. It becomes something, all sculptures have armatures, whether that armature is a thought or an idea. All ideas have armatures. An armature can be kind of like a wire in the brain that you still start building around putting things, holding things onto. But if you think of a circle, it's like a primitive armature. It cannot be shrunk to an infinitesimal because it always has that relationship to its inside and outside if it's retaining its circleness. It's a very sculptural thought, I think. This is a, 
Anacapa Island, the far uh, eastern edge of it, and that's Arch Rock. This is off of the coast of Los Angeles. Some eco-terrorists that I knew wanted to blow that arch up because it's beloved by all of Southern California, and that's Sail Rock right behind it. And they wanted to blow it up to prove the point that only humans like it. The seals and the seagulls don't give a crap about the arch. But unlike the hole in the Picasso guitar, which is through construction, Picasso finds deconstruction. And this is a much different kind of hole. It's coming through erosion. And it's not a hole in a mathematical sense. And it is a postcard, that's what I'm trying to say. It's an image of a, of, of a place. But I brought it here in the talk because I wanted to talk a little bit also about when you think of sculpture with holes, most people think instantly of Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth. Moore said, it's very natural for me to put a hole in a sculpture because a body has holes. You know, it's two eyes, a mouth, ears. But I guess I'm questioning, is it a hole? And philosophically, is, does anything happen when you move through the hole? Is space different on the other side? Or is it a way to make a passage to, to flow through it? I mean, I guess I'm questioning, is a hole a passage? Or like I said before, is it a sculptural armature? And there isn't answers to these things. It's the musing, you know, the, the thinking of a sculptor. So when I say, is it this or is it that, um, I, I don't mean it as a dogma. I like to say that's obviously that's a whole. So, you know, I don't mean it scholarly or as a dogma saying that's not a whole. To me, this whole brings you, it, you flow to the back of the sculpture. You become aware of space in an aestheticized way. You don't learn anything more about space, but you have peace. You kind of flow in and around and through it, and, and you find a sculptural sense of it. This is one of Moore's very early work, and him and Hepworth were friends, and she has one very similar to it. And you can vaguely see the torso, where this hole becomes almost like the belly of the sculpture. I mean, this is unfair, but when I had the experience of looking at a more, it's unfair to say this in the slide, because you can kind of say anything in a photograph, you know, when you're talking like this. But the wall behind the sculpture is the same through the hole as it is on the other side. Moore said that the art of sculpture is the art of the hole and the lump. And I think that's a fascinating thought and a really interesting idea. And is this a hole in a lump, though? This is a more. There is a, bourgeois would be the wrong word, there, there is a consumerism. There, there is a design aspect, I think, to 
the necessity to understand the sculpture with Hepworth and, and, and more. You can easily use the lump as a cork in your mind and stretch it around and plug that hole or think of plugging the hole. As well as you can do the math and find the negative and the positive within the same sculpture. There is an ability for the viewer to possess, to, to not overwhelm the sculpture, but to understand the space of the sculpture. It's a use of a space that we understand or that we've been in before. This is a sculpture, again, early. Uh, Hepworth and um, Moore were making in 32, I think, putting their first holes in their, their carvings. And this is art. And it's just about the same time. And this sculpture is called, beautifully, I think, the title is Two Thoughts. Are the two thoughts the two objects, or are they one thought and the white object with the whole another thought? Do you see the whole as a mouth or a navel? It's a very beautiful sculpture. And I think, in a way different than Moore and Hepworth, you can't possess it. It doesn't possess you, but it has an internal structure or um, a life of its own. I kind of think at the end of humanity, the Moore and the Hepworth might turn off, but you like to think that this won't. And I think they're not holes. I think that that object in the last one is not a hole, and I think this is not a hole. I find these forms about growth, biology, that it's, 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 it's a manipulation of material growing, and it's, it's almost like what we see as a whole is definitely not a passage, but it's equal, like in this one, to one of the forms in the sculpture itself. The whole, in a very odd way, is a positive. And there is this kind of strange and beautiful biology to art, I think, a biomorphism, where in Moore and Hepworth you see and understand an artist carving and stepping back and looking and struggling with material and laminating and choosing a base. And you feel with art almost like, you know, he's inconsequential, that he's not here, that the work itself grew from a seed. This is... Um, From a friend of mine, I had to just get my place right where I am. When I got married uh, several years ago, a friend of mine, a designer, a friend of my wife's who's Italian, named Carlo Bucco, and I can't, I couldn't have a photograph of it because it, it, it's a colander that he personally made. It's a famous uh, designer from Torino. He personally made it for Sylvia and I, but it's, the image is copyrighted. He only made one, and he doesn't want it in slides. So I put in this drawing <laughs> of it. 
and you all know what a colander is. And the story is a friend of mine, another friend, was visiting, and he's an Italian philosopher by the name of Marco Intero. And he opened my kitchen drawer late at night looking for a coffee cup, and he came in and he goes, upset, super upset, I was just going to bed. He says, what in the hell, Charlie, do you have that metal object around all those beautiful holes in your kitchen drawer? And I couldn't understand, but now I think I do. And it's only an observation, I think, that a philosopher could make. <laughs> but I wanted to tell that story when I moved into um, both in landing, and, and I'll talk a little briefly about the work of David Smith. You can almost see these two hoops in the same way as metal objects around holes. This is a work in your collection called the Stainless Window. And for a minute I wanted to, it's a David Smith work in Bolton Landing, I think it has a marvelous uh, relationship to the landscape, but I wanted to go back just a few <clears throat> slides to um, when I was talking about uh, armature and that everything, I mean, when I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that one can think about the world if you're a sculptor, you can think about the world sculpturally rather than about sculpture. And uh, I'm always looking for the armature, where that might be in an idea or in a thought. And um, that notion of uh, a circle not being able to be shrunk to a point, and that in my mind being a primal or primitive armature. Smith has such an ability, so when he uses scrap material, when it comes through his hands, it's almost like it's clay, like he's molded it and pulled it and extruded it through his forefinger and thumb. And he's working with it in an incredible space, but a shallow space. But it's not, it's shallow yet vibrant and infinite. And I have a, thought about some of these works of Smith's that they're in a sense armature space itself clings to them like clay clings to a metal armature if you turn this sculpture around the whole world would turn with it it's embedded in space in this ultimately fundamental way I wanted to talk about this sculpture a little bit, and it's called Candita Untitled. And Smith built his sculptures. And you know, he often worked on the floor, and he would weld them, then lift them up later. So I have a thought about this one in particular that I think is really important, and it's really the major aspect of what this talk was sort of originally built around for me, is if we went there, like we can't go there now because it's not there in the same way and the sculpture's not there, but let's just say we could go there, take your cell phone out of your pocket and throw it through the hole in this piece. It wouldn't go through. It would hit the negative spot, or what we see as negative spot, and it would bounce off. He somehow was able to build with space. Maybe it's how he built, how he worked, and it looks like a flat piece, but it's not flat at all. <clears throat> built it on the ground, but those plates are staggered. And very, 
intuitive, thought out, sculptural ways. When you hit where the lower uh, verticals hit the base, which is stainless ground too, there's a distortion where space itself starts rolling in a, in, in, in a way that Anish Kapoor wishes his big bean in Chicago would roll, but only is related to a funfair mirror. In Smith, space does something down there that is really, truly disturbing. It's a very simple piece, but it's almost as if Smith, in this shallow space, and only by using such a shallow space, was able to actually build with space. That is never a frame. It's never a passage. It's as if the landscape itself has been digested by the sculpture. It's been, the, you know, the, the very space of the landscape has been internalized by the sculpture. It all is very simple, but at the same time, I think, as many profound and difficult things are seemingly simple. It's, it, to me, it's just an extraordinarily spatial sculpture, all existing in a you know, space about this thick. But there is no way one could term this as a flat sculpture. So I go back to what I said at the very beginning of the talk, that space itself is a sculptor's primary medium. We're not building in space, we're building with space. And you know, we're born into this space, we don't know what it is. And you really see Smith's involvement with space as a material in a work like this. And then if we go quickly to Hepworth, not a huge stretch of imagination, but a landscape, metal, holes through it. You could throw, both of us could throw our cell phones through this. I'll take the top hole, you take the bottom, and they'll sail right through. I'm not saying that makes it bad. It's a different bird. It's possessable. The smith is primitive. And by primitive, I don't mean unsophisticated. I mean, it's foundational. It's embedded in the world in a very foundational position. You need to build the foundation and lay that concrete first when you build a house. It's like at the building, the drawing center, they're still working on the concrete. Uh, philosophers talk about a primitive is where you can't reduce it and break it into parts anymore. It's, 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 it's very clearly embedded. You can't even see through it because what is on the other side is in it rather than through it. What Smith did, you cannot buy. You can, yeah, a rich Russian can come and buy that for enough money and bring it to the garage in Moscow or wherever they're showing now. Or, uh, and then auction it or whatnot. But you, you, you fundamentally, philosophically can't buy it. It belongs to all of us. I believe the Hepworth, you can buy it. Now, she was a harp player too, but she's got the strings beautifully through it. But that will stop your cell phone from going all the way through. And it also makes it tames that space, rightly so, and again, you can possess the sculpture in your understanding. The space through and in this sculpture, I guess what I'm saying is not primitive the way the Smith space is, or the Picasso space of those guitars are. It's a space that's similar to the space in your purse or under your chair. I'm not saying it's not poetic 
or I'm not saying it's not beautiful, but it's a space that you can find at home. This is uh, Borofsky's work, and it's holes, of course, but they're not holes. They're images, holes as molecules. This is more complicated, but no different, I think, than the Borofsky. What Anish Kapoor did, these are big sandstone chunks of rock, you know, as high as the point there, they're big. And he carved them out from underneath and covered it and painted with pigment inside black. So what appears like black circles painted on the top of the stone is voids that go into the stone. And I'm not saying that that's a gimmick, but I think when you understand it, when you get there, the, it, it's an illusion, and it's ultimately, again, possess, possessable and understandable, and I think designable. And here we have the same piece as the Kapoor. And even if this could really work, if you could really do this, if a physicist brought you this map that you could jump through, it would not be as powerful as the Smith. Right? Because it would be you know, mysterious, quantum, it would be crazy, but it would again be physics, not art, it would be possessible. We go to the armature and just want to talk a little bit again about space and, and the unknot is a circle. You cannot take that out of two-dimensional space. Right? You get it out of two-dimensional space, it's not a circle, not a pure circle, it's a hula hoop, it's a torus, okay? Because it has dimension to its lines. Circle only exists truly in two-dimensional space. The prime knot can't exist in two-dimensional space. I can only have a drawing of it. But when that prime knot is in three-dimensional space, I cannot remove it from three-dimensional space because it's locked <coughs> in this space the way the circle is locked in two-dimensional space. And I wanted to use that example of the prime knot to lead us a little bit into the spaces in the, of, of Tony Smith. And this is from, I think, 67 or 60, yeah, 67, I believe. And it's called Smoke. And uh, Ronnie Bladen's Big X was on the other side. But uh, when it first all oh, this event, for, this is at the Corcoran in Washington, D.C., Ronnie Smith's Big X was as powerful in our minds, everybody's minds. But nobody remembers it now, and everybody remembers the Smith. And to Smith once said, he said, all of space is a matrix. And a sculpture is if you take a big Sharpie and fill in some of the spaces of this matrix. And this was a Time Magazine cover, I think, what's our date, 67. It says, art outgrows the museum. And in the article, in the interview, Smith says very beautifully to the reporter, he just brings him in he's to the Corcoran in D.C. and says, have you ever seen anything like this before? I haven't. Isn't it fantastic? Isn't it weird? I mean, it was a very new spatial experience. And it's not negative space in that matrix, but it... When, when you walk around 
these big pieces of Smith, they're almost like uh, digital clocks. They change their orientation, kind of, you know, as you move around. What exists in this space? You know, what? There's a Giacometti in Basel, the cat. This is very small, Giacometti, uh, city square. He made some smaller sculptures as well. But I wanted to, again, talk about the circle. That what do I mean by an armature in sculpture that, that, and that the circle can't be shrunk to, an, to a point, thus it is an armature. The sculpture, <clears throat> you never look at a small Giacometti and say, oh, look at the little guys. You say, Jesus, that guy could sculpt. I mean, he could even make one the size of your thumb and it was like human. They cannot be shrunk to a point. They're armatures. Like a circle, it can't be shrunk. This piece is, holds the civic, political, primitive band of cro magnum men on the early plain, or you know, the plaza out in, you know, in New York. It, They can't be separated from space. Space really clings to the figures. Giacometti, I talked about this before, in an interview, he said to the interviewer, he said, I try to make my figurative sculptures as realistically as possible. And the interviewer said, oh, you, what are you saying? Come on, artist exaggeration here. You know, they look like Hiroshima man. These big feet, they're burnt to a crisp, and they're so elongated, they're all... <clears throat> he said, Giacometti said, no. Because when I see you, I see your knee, your toe, your nipple, your hand, your nose, your eye. To see you, all of you, I have to scan you. And it's not till I back up across the space, across the room, that I can see all of you. But then I don't just see you, but I see this huge vista of space coming in, around, sculpting you, making you, creating you. So, like, space itself comes in and is the artist of a Giacometti. It's what is making the Giacometti. It's compressing the figure. It's, it's realism. We're born into this space. This is a medium. And I show this because Judd, this is a Bontecu, and they're hard to photograph because they flatten out, but they come out like volcanoes. And Judd said a beautiful thing. He said, Bontecu doesn't depict holes. It's not a depiction of a hole. It is a hole. And that's a kind of an incredible thing. He said there are two elements. There's the hole and the canvas and the, you know, the armature. Also, he said she was the first artist to use the armature as a formal element in the work, where you know, she's using the copper rods to stitch the canvas to, and it's, it's apparent. This is a, another Hepworth, and I wanted to show it in relationship to the sculpture that's going to come next, but also to the Bontecues. 
Because again, the passages are possessable, where I think the Bontecu passage, the whole, is a whole. This sculpture, I feel, I can contain it in my mind. Where Giacometti's palace at 4 a.m., like Bontecu's sculpture, it's memory, and it is a whole itself, and it's unpossessable. I have, if I deal with this work, it possesses me rather than I possessing it. I fall into it. It's a very powerful piece of sculpture that I think truly transcends itself in a genre and becomes, as a whole, a place. And it's all armed. This is Oldenburg's bat, which I'm still thinking about, so I won't talk too much about it. The wiffle is structure that's very beautiful because of a wiffle bat. Uh, there is a civic nature to the piece, and it being in Chicago and its relationship to uh, 68 and the convention and the police clubbing people. It's a, it's a pretty uh, difficult sculpture to remove from its embedment, not just spatially, but also socially. This is a work of mine called Table. And I talk a little bit about, and I'm going to, in the future lectures, I spent my whole career trying to learn <clears throat> how to manipulate space and how to embed an object in space. And by embedding, I mean, so you can't, uh, the Anish Kapoor to me is not embedded, those holes in space. You can put it in your pocket and go home and talk about it. So I saw this thing this guy did, it was fantastic. These big stone blocks, and he carved out holes underneath them, and then put a hole, and it felt like it was this flat hole, but it was really a spatial hole. It's like, you know, you can find it and understand it. This was a, piece I had in a retrospective of mine years ago, and after the show, I felt it was the only sculpture I couldn't do that to, I couldn't talk about, that I couldn't put it in my pocket and trade like a baseball gum card, you know, like a, like a baseball card, a uh, chewing gum card. And it was unmovable from its location. And what it is, it's topologically complete in that it's fused to the surface so an ant could crawl from the top of the table up through a glass, down the glass, and end up under the table. So the world flows in and around and through it and all across it. Only the kind of kitschy cotton uh, ball jar kind of puts a lid and stops it for a second there. But and put the uh, clicker somewhere. You know, I can go to this, maybe. Oh, here it is. I got it. It kind of just disappeared on me. This is a Donald Judd, and it's a very, I think, poetic and beautiful work. It is considered so minimal and abstract. But if you think back to those arps, I'm not saying it's like the arp, but the biological aspect of the arp, this is almost feels like a body. And the plexiglass, and this particular one is worn. He made three versions, but this is kind of a orangish, yellowish plexi. Stainless ends that are made like uh, air conditioning or like an like a air vent thing. So, the tunnel goes through, and what you're seeing through the plexiglass is the outside of the tunnel, and that's the inside of the tunnel. So when I mentioned at the very beginning about embedment, and I said, like, if you were a four-dimensional creature, 
looking at us, you could see your inside and your outside of your neighbor simultaneously. This is happening here. You see the entire structure at the same time. You see the structures, interior and total exterior. And it further has the kind of notion, if I ate a ping pong ball, what would that look like to a four-dimensional creature? Would he also see the inside of the ping pong ball in my inside? Of course he would. So, you know, you have several levels of inside. It's, it's, it's open dimensionally. And when Augustine said and pointed to the fact that the fourth dimension is non-existent, and the proof of that is because you cannot point in its direction, and you still can't, but it's, it's very interesting to think about an object like this, and um, you can think about it for a long time if you're in front of it, I think. And you think about our condition. This is a grave steely from uh, 425, I think, uh, from Athens. And it's a relief. of a girl who, a young girl who died. And I personally find it one of the most extraordinary sculptors, sculptures in the world. And it's incredibly philosophical and poetic. And I, th I think a physicist could learn from it. It's, you move into it. You understand it's very flat and schematic, but beautifully rendered. And as you move into it, and you get to the child's mouth, and the only relief of this relief is the space between the lip of the girl and the beak of the bird that flows. If you look close, you see there's air between there. And that's why I was so belittling the arch at arch rock, which nothing flows through except a seagull and a wave. But what is flowing through there is life. It's, 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 it's panoima, her breath, bird song, space itself, where for once you can take the life force of the space we live in, and it's as if you can put it, it's about this big, in your hand and hold it and study it and look at it not in a cold scientific way as Picasso's guitars are, but in this most extraordinarily mournful yet true philosophical way. And only again possible, not as a moment in the sculpture, but in relation, it's only possible this three-dimensionality, this bit of space through image, but also through the relief to depiction and reality, that relationship. It, it is just so um, unbelievably uh, speaking, not to the girl's death, but to our condition. In the world. As um, from down the street, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said a very beautiful thing. He said, after creation, there were more beings in the world, but being itself did not increase. And I think you see it in this piece, that space itself is being. This is just, I think, sculpturally extraordinary. And I wanted to end because the next talk was going to be on um, Matisse when I mentioned superclay, but it's also focusing on Rodin, Degas, and Matisse. And I've thought for the last year or so about the burgers. So I went to um, where the, I opened with that slide of Balzac's, the stone head of Balzac, 
and the eyes as black holes where you know, light in the world goes in, like pushing out through the sculpting. And um, you all know the burgers in the story of, of, of the burgers. It's one of our famous sculptures. Uh, there's a few places in the world, like at the, at the museum, the Rodin Museum, and also in California at the Norton Simon, where they've taken uh, some of the figures, other figures of Balzac, or for, of, of the Burgers of Calais, and have them around in the same region as the sculpture itself. And I never understood, and there's so many ways to approach Rodin that I can't go into them all at the end of the talk. But one way is, the, is just the spatial, and you know, this is ignoring the surface and the imagistic aspects that are so powerful. But if we just concentrate for a moment on the spatial disjunction, that's radically different views as you move around a sculpture of one of the figures, that is, when you approach it, it's just fine, and like me, it's vertical. As you move around it, it radically shifts its orientation to the world. It's just, it's, it's just kind of like disjarring and extraordinary. It reminds me of those gimmick devices you see sometimes in uh, charity drives or at fairs where you throw a nickel on the top and it starts spinning down the cone, the vortex, is it going faster and faster? It's as if the hole, the black hole, the energy of gravity, the attraction is somewhere out around this figure and he's being affected by it, you know? I mean, just you go around this, it's hard to capture. So when Rodin made these, he didn't, when he got the commission, the, one of the earlier ideas of Rodin is these were just going to be down on ground level with us in the plaza, you know, around, put around the city square. And then for a while he thought of putting them all together up in the sky on a big pedestal. But what happened, which I think is so radical, which I haven't, you know, because you can look at Rodin and the burghers as mirology, as holes and parts, and you can see in you know, some of these museums, you know, these figures with clothes on, without clothes, and parts, and, and you know, he takes the hands off these and puts them on other sculptures. Uh, it's really extraordinary. But So he takes these figures. All of them have this kind of incredible gravitational force, not dissimilar to Balzac's position in the world. And he puts them all together onto one base with their pre-existing bases. Not one sculpture touches. Not one figure touches another figure. Not one figure looks at another figure. They're all isolated in their own world. But you see, he's just thrown the bases from the other sculptures that are just kind of embedded in this big chunk of clay. So in my mind, it's as if you took the Earth, the Moon, maybe the Sun, a few comets, maybe another star or two, and threw them all in a bag and then looked inside. You would have this great force of gravitation and energy and attraction and repulsion, and you see these just world force between these figures. that can only occur sculpturally, yet at the same time it conjures up some aspect about all of us sitting here in this room. You know, we have enemies probably in the room itself, friends, you know, secrets, people, there's trajectories between you, you know, but you're not touching. You know, and there, there, it's just an incredibly abstract physical object at the same time so political and social. And that can happen in Rodin, and it can happen through Rodin being a sculptor. You know, Rodin would have taken a Balzac and turned it into a salt and pepper shaker. He needed money so bad half the time. 
you know, he made such schlock, like those kissing things and this and that. But, you know, he was a nine to fiver. He kept at it. And these kind of profundities happened because he didn't think about his sculpture, but he thought sculpturally. He thought through sculpture. It wasn't preconceived. He was thinking, what do I do? How do I, you know, I'm just this kind of floating and this bubbling in this uh, world. Anyway, so that, that is my talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. I have a mic here if anybody has questions. Um, thank you for that wonderful talk. It was really inspiring. Um, when you talk about um, the Kapoor, you said in the beginning, well, it's not gimmicky, you know, the holes, yeah. but you seem to actually, in a way, imply that they are, because yeah. You, you said that this kind of sculpture you can take home, whereas, um, uh, I'm blanking now, the sculpture outside, um, the smith, the smith, excuse me, it, it seems to have the most power for you, and it kind of, it, in a way, is less, for lack of a better word, less bourgeois, the, mm -hmm. the way we look at it and the way it's embedded in nature. Harder so to it, possess, yes, harder to possess. Maybe. So does it have more value for you, the Smith, than, than the kinds of work that Kapoor does? Well, because I still don't understand the Smith. Okay. You know, and, and I think the Smith, the Smith, you know, when I talk about the girl, Steely, the grave, you know, I mean, I have a friend, a scholar, who says, oh yeah, they were thinking about that, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't know who she was, what she was. Uh, it's contemporary because we can, because it's alive, because we can still see it. I guess that's what I'm saying. I don't understand the Smith. You, you, you. It might not feel that way to another generation, but I'm pretty sure it will still be engaging on some deep, profound level. Um, the Kapoor, why, why I was saying it wasn't gimmicky. Because I think it's a good sculpture, you know. I think it's a. I, I think it's one of his best sculptures, and I think it's a beautiful sculpture. But I already understood it. It's the same, which I think. Um, you know, the guy with the volcano out west, uh, Terrell. I think he's a good sculptor, you know, and interesting. But I understand it in a way, you know the. And it isn't a gimmick because it's, a, that's why I say, I don't want to fall that it's there just because it's an illusion. You know, I don't mean a gimmick that way. And, and we all, it's, it's hard to know if you're being gimmicky or what the, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to break from that. So know? the ones that hold more mystery for you have sustained you. I hope that's you. not it because, I hope that's not it because, uh, I, you know, maybe that's all, maybe that's what it is, because, you know, one person's mystery is, you know, another person's, <laughs> you know? So I hope it's something more primitive. Thank you. In a, in a way, I hope. Like the Balzac eyes are, to me, primitive. And, you know, I mean, it's not something that you can take apart and understand the way I can understand the Kapoor holes and appreciate them and like them and put them in my pocket though in the end, where those eyes of us, our contemporary world going in and then, you know, like coming out through his modeling or his carving, it's, it's, it's a, an extraordinary equation that, um, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't exist uh, just in the sculpture somehow, you know. Yes. Um, I, I'm interested. You, you have such amazing topics that you're talking about and like this, this thought of 
not thinking of sculpture, but thinking sculpturally is one of those things that on the surface is so simple, but yet it's really massive. And I'm wondering what your road to that understanding was. Like, where did you go from being somebody new to art to beginning to understand these massive things? Was there a singular sculpture or a moment early in your career that kind of started breaking these ideas open for you? I'm wondering where you started with it. I think it happened, uh, I always liked w building things when I was a young kid. So I always built and, you know, and bragged about it so, totally. And I liked the relationship of building and, uh, you know, owning what I made or, you know, looking like forts or this or this or that. And um, I had a great deal of difficulty in school for, with learning uh, disabilities and didn't kind of come on to my own intellectually until maybe my second year in high school. Or, but that was more through books and then wrote memory because the only way I, I could do it. And I went to a uh, Catholic military school that was very rough and just had four big rooms. And we lived, I lived with 40 kids for four years very, very strict place. And I experimented a little bit with hallucinatory drugs, and I was, my head was in the 60s, because it was in the 60s, with my friends and the changing, these times are changing kind of business. But I was stuck inside of Memphis type of thing, you know? But it was very, very formal, and there were very, it was beautiful in its simplicity. Like, you got beat if you did this, you know, you got this, you know, you, you would bugle blue, you got out of bed, you know. Everything had, a, and that was, you know, you made beds with square corners and they had to bounce a quarter off of it. So I had all that and I learned to hate it, I always hated it, but I ended up at university after that experience and I only bring up the hallucinatory experiences because of the rigidity of that kind of relationship between those two things, um, which I thought I was all hallucination. You know, I thought I was all psychedelic drugs, but little did I know, I was, I like to say 50%, but I'm probably 90% military school, still. <laughs> <laughs> but, so then I entered university and I walked into this class by accident. I wanted to take sculpture. I walked into an advanced sculpture class that was being taught by one of Anthony Caro's students from Britain, who was really mean and really strict. And uh, I came late, and uh, he let me in for some crazy reason, because he was, you know, he just did. And I welded this thing up, you know, spatial configuration, and it, I took these cartwheels and put them on the ends of this configuration. And I think it was pretty good. You know, I just learned the weld that morning. I did this for the class. I hadn't talked about it yet. And uh, I was walking, but very dazed. I, I was kind of out of it. Not on drugs, just as a person. And I was walking through the college town, Iowa City, and I, he was at a stoplight. I was quite embarrassed. It would be like running into your shrink at a cocktail party or something, you know? And uh, I didn't really know what to say. And he came up to me, and his wife was there, and he said, that was an interesting sculpture you made today. Spatially, it was very interesting. But you took those wheels, and you put them on like flowers. And that is like, you want to make something instead of discover something. He said, don't ever fucking do that again in my class. <laughs> and it was like this formality and this rigidity with the experiential quality of high modernism. You know, we like to think of high modernism and take free to value, but you know, if you look at a really great Carl from the 60s, you know, it's hallucinogenic. It's a knock on a door. Right? It's like it opens up and there's people, you know, in green vinyl miniskirts and polka dot pants, guys with weird sunglasses. And they say, we got pot, come on in. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a also that's denied in high modernism because you can't talk about that aspect, and that aspect of it makes it born into the world, alive and present. You know, it's was more just you know the Beatles in '62 were singing "I want to hold your hand," 
And Carl is making these hallucinogenic, uh, almost prophetic things for the, you know, that are being launched into the future. It's like they're extraordinarily in tune, uh, you know, that they were born alive. You know, they were, you know, you never get tired of looking at uh, early one morning, but who wants to listen to I want to hold your hand? You know, you can hear better versions from the 50s of, you know, blues music or whatever. Yeah. Hi, over here. <laughs> Thank you for that talk. Um, you said at one point while you were speaking that you spent your career trying to figure out how to embed things, and I know that embeddedness is a term that's really important for you. My question is, have you figured it out? Or is it something that perhaps you don't ever figure out? It happens. You probably never figure it out, but um, you know, then you just, life is too short, which is the beauty of life, right? That you die. And, uh, you know, you don't get it finished. But, you know, I have grown to see that I spent all this time embedding spatially. And then um, temporally. I saw time eventually as a dimension. And then eventually uh, the art historian I misunderstood, Ann Wagner, wrote a, uh, um, did, did, did the review of a show of mine, a, a retrospective in 98. And she said, Charles Ray works for a dream audience. And I thought she meant that I was so busy trying to embed spatially that I lost track of the very people who were coming, the real live flesh and blood people that were coming to look. So I, thought, I always thought they get in the way. You know, they touch things, they break things, and, you know, now they have cameras and they're taking selfies all the time, they're bumping into things, they're touching it, you know, they're taking, you know, the, the, all the stains on my sculptures are where people going like this because of the selfies. But I hate the people. People have always been my problem. <laughs> you know? But then Anne told me that she didn't mean that as a criticism, she meant it as a compliment, that I worked for a dream audience and then they would have to come up to the level of the dream. But I still see it the other way and thought about it for years. What did she mean exactly? And I see the potential, not of quote unquote public art, but of the surface of the, of embedding in the social sphere. You know, embedding, I would like to embed the work in the people. And I see that as an extension of the spatial and temporal embedment. Uh, um, in a way, this is that way. Giacometti, you could graffiti this thing and it would still, you know? I mean, the answer to graffiti isn't guards and electric fences. It's making the sculpture be able to have the balls to stand up to it, you know, to, to, to move through it. Some of Oldenburg's work does that, but not very much, a little bit. Maybe he never even does it. But. So to, to, yeah, that's my answer. I don't know how to do it at all. The, the spinning circle that you showed earlier of your work made me think of a piece I saw years ago in your show in LA where the objects on the table were spinning extremely slowly. Yeah. And suddenly I thought, Maybe there's something about time as well. So could you maybe comment on, are you thinking about time? Yeah, but not, you know, and that sculpture began with like a lot of clocks embedded in a table and objects on a table. And they were like spiders, almost like clock time is biology and it slowly solved itself sculpturally that way where it was just these few objects moving on, on the table, but I didn't, I didn't mean it that way the last time I, meant, I, I mentioned it. I mentioned like, um, I made some works of recent years that I didn't make in, in a way, that they made themselves. And uh, you know, I think a lot about ancient art and you know, why is it, I asked a friend of mine, the scholar Richard Neer, you know, why do you think the Kuros is so contemporary? He says, because you can still see it. It was sculpted so beautifully. And its original purpose and meaning is 
you know, it's the first thing that's just the fire hose of time washes away, you know. Art drifts away from our critical control. It drifts away from its initial intention. But if you find the art part of it, not the intentional part of it, but the art part of it, you know, that exists in time in a way. And, and uh, I, so I was thinking of how do you embed temporally. And the first way to do it is you have to push it away from your authorship, you know, from yourself. Great art is anonymous. You know, we don't know who made the great art. Who is Rembrandt? You know, we don't even know if Shakespeare was Shakespeare, right? I mean, but we don't know who Rembrandt was. I mean, he's not a guy running around here anymore. You know, and you, as, you know, it's a mistake to think you live on in your artwork. When you die, I think the world in the most beautiful way, you know, it's like a hole, a sand hole a kid digs on the beach, you know, and the tide comes in, the sand of the world just seamlessly fills it. You know, and by two minutes into the high tide, there's just like no trace. It seamlessly closes in around it, you know, and it's the world. But to, just to launch these things into a, into a deeper time, you know, where they move away from you. And, and it's not about immortality either. So. And I, I think you make them in such a way that the experience of looking at them already starts to allude to that, that temporal embedment. Oh, thank you for your wonderful lecture. You know, I was very fascinated that you make some incredible parallels to the world of physics. So, and in, over historically, you've mentioned some incredible physicists and there have been some very disruptive thinkers. So for instance, there is a book written by Lisa Randall. Uh, she's a physicist at Harvard. It's called Warped Passages. And in it, she makes a lot of analogies that you do. There's a book called Flatlands written years ago yeah, and about a world of two dimensional people. And as you say, that when you put a circle through their world, a sphere through the world, they see a circle enlarge and shrink. When you put a cube, they see a square that disappears. And, and Lisa Randall, in her book, thinks that there's many, she calls them brains instead of dimensions, B-R-A-N-E-S, that we're sitting on membranes, and there may be 13 or 14 dimensions of membranes, and until you're on the higher ones, you can't possibly see the lower ones. But what I'm wondering is, when brilliant and great sculptors like yourself, or Kapoor, or Smith, or Rodin see things, do you see in a disruptive way that most everybody else cannot? So for instance, no, the person- No, not at all. I, I don't see that way ever. What I do is I like just look at the thing. Ah, that looks really terrible. What do you think's wrong with it? What if we, you know, let's make the knuckle like you know less look like scored lines. It looks yeah yeah. The knuckle looks like someone took a pencil and drew it on. Let's give it a, but just a little, you know. And then it's oh let's erase that. And it, it just it makes itself. But I don't. I don't see anything like that. I see um, my sculpture. I said, so how do I make it a little better? Like how, ah, you know, it's like just not working. So I just see it like, you know, and I'll do anything to make it work. Let's say it's about, you know, let's say I make a sculpture about, um, Man's inhumanity to birds, right? Men are shooting birds with shotguns every day, and I don't like it. You know, it's not working. And someone says, well, if you turn it upside down and move it this way, you know, that problem will kind of go away. And I'll say, yeah, but then it looks like the bird shitting on the man. It's no longer the man's inhumanity to the bird. I don't care. You know, if it's a good sculpture, I'll go with it. Because it will always be a good sculpture and our relationship to birds will change. <laughs> but I guess I'm wondering, similar as a previous uh, question raised, that when you said that you didn't understand, uh, for instance, a Smith, but you understood the, uh, Kapoor, was it your whole life that you had this understanding, or is there, as you learned and created more, that you get this understanding? Because when people see, for instance, all types of art, whether it be painted, uh, there's 
at a certain level of understanding education, one understands differences that one otherwise wouldn't. Do you have no, you reached? No, and everything that we look at, I think we also exaggerate to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, so one can talk some aspects of art, and it's how you really want them to be. You know, what they're bringing you up to be. They're not that way. And the artist maybe didn't really, you know, it's, that's not what I was doing or something, but, you know, the art has a beautiful ability to bring us all to different places. It's very uh, open that way, you know. I, I don't, this is not a scholar's talk, you know, so it's like how I look at things and then take and then try to, you know, to take and do. So I'm looking at Smith from years of looking at him and uh, talking to other people's ideas about him, but also through what I, you know, my own eyes. Like, you know, Judd wrote so beautifully about everybody's work. What he said about Montague, you know, it's like she's the first artist where the armature itself is part of the piece, where the she's not depicting a whole. She's it is a whole. And that there's two elements in a Montague: the form, not all the parts. And you know, Montague saw it looking like you know weird eyes and crazy stuff. You know, Judd just saw it like it could be one element, and then the whole. It was like just two elements. Judd was taking these things apart and using it via his own program, his own art. But her sculpture, strong enough to stand up to it. And, you know, my wife likes me, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, am I really that way, what she thinks? I think we'll take one more question. I know you've got another engagement. Hi, thanks for the lecture. It was really great. Um, this might be a, a small ramble, but I'm going to try to get to a point. Um, so this is my first time in the space, and it was really interesting to see the talk projected in front of these masks. Um, and when we got to the, the Picasso um, slides with the guitars, um, my eyes kept kind of going back and forth to the masks and to the, and to the guitar. And I was thinking about this kind of, <laughs> this way that you're talking about, this objective um, way in which sculpture sits in time, um, and this thing about possession, not being able to possess um, this thing. Um, and, that's, and that's how it kind of is able to kind of exist um, in long time. Um, so naturally, <clears throat> I think, when I think of Picasso's guitars, I automatically think of West African um, masks and how part of his advancement into Cubism was through the possession of these masks that is directly related to imperial colonialism. So placing this artist um, in this space of long time through the possession of another, several other cultures kind of like production. Um, uh, it, it complicates that for me um, because I wonder, um, if that would be possible, uh, understanding the cultural implica implications of, um, uh, implications of a time. Um, because the masks on the wall are kind of neutered in a sense. Um, they're not seen in its, their original context. And so maybe this idea of like these, um, these masks on the wall um, being able to exist a long time no longer exist simply because of their cultural, um, the cultural space that they're in. The fact that they're here um, and kind of presented in the way that they are has nothing to do really with the purpose of the object themselves. They kind of lose an autonomy in a sense. Um, so although I want to believe that work um, can be really, really great because it loses all of its, um, um, it loses 
the way that we think about it um, culturally, politically, um, it just becomes a bit of an issue. Um, uh, <laughs> when, um, when I think about um, all of the material realities um, that kind of like that surround it. Yeah. So, so sometimes I, I wonder if, you know, um, maybe we can sacrifice this long time for something, um, uh, for, for an effect in the present. And if that is still good art. Well, you have to answer that. I'm not for saying you have to answer that yourself, but it's um, a whole area that it sounds like you should enter. And I don't have a good answer for the question. But, you know, I would say, you know, when I started work, what was really, there were a lot of rules and a lot of things you just could not do. And one of them was making figurative art for many really, really good reasons that it was just considered like the worst thing that an artist in 1969, 1970 could do was to start taking a piece of clay and modeling the likeness of somebody. Just don't do it if you want to be here, you know? And now it's all I do. So, there were good reasons. It's, it's what, what I'm trying to say is, it sounds like you have a really great place to be in what you said. You know, as a young artist, if you are an artist or if you're a scholar, to, to you know, do something with that, to divulge in, into it. Because I don't have the answer. If, you know, I mean, I think it's interesting that some of the masks are uh, almost like disarmed nuclear bombs, is one way one scholar put it, that they're here. And some of the Met, I know, even some of the uh, uh, hair has been taken off of them to denuder them. Um, so it's an interesting perspective and an interesting place to work from, to do work from, I think. But I, I think it needs um, the question that you ask or we're forming. I think we need to move away from the celebration of that question and go into the hard realities of it and um, move into it's hard to separate things out. So I won't say the political aspect of it, but I will say the celebratory aspect of it. You know, the um, information as position, kind of. You know, the, like it as a position. Um, I, I, I think the work to your question will never have an answer. You know, that question will never have an answer. And, um, you know, some people who I respect a lot say that these objects belong to humanity. And other people say that's ridiculous. And then we see what's happening in Syria with the destruction of monuments. So what are these things? They're things. They're, they're artifacts that human beings made. Who owns them? You know, and the post-colonial question is extremely powerful and interesting. And it's, it's also like playing a little bit with guns, kind of. You, you need to work it rather than, you know, people tend to uh, separate people with it, you know. But it, it, the, the real work that needs to be done in there, and I think the real deep thinking that has to come from it um, doesn't have an answer, but has a multitude of solutions and directions to try to build uh, the world with. You know, the world is always falling apart and it isn't like we've got to repair it. We have to build it. We have to make it. So I think it's a good place to be. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody, Mr. Ray. Uh, thank you.
Mr. Ray will be back for two more lectures on Friday, January 22nd and Friday, March 4th. There's flyers back here if you'd like to pick one up. Thank you.